Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time you may be uh, checking in. We um, head into uh, another section that is just chock filled of um, oh, a lot of um, mention and and headlines. And uh, in fact, there's just so much going on; it's uh, it's difficult to. Uh, keep up with it and uh, like you know again like the last chapter uh, quite candidly and again you know one of the things about teaching geography you've really got to get uh current books right to um stay up with things and of course as a someone running the classes you got to um stay up with the current events and you know world events and have a enjoyment which i do of um, looking into those things. So we, um, as I promised, we are making our way to East Asia. And uh, we're primarily going to focus on uh, China, Japan, and the Koreas. And uh, no surprises, right? And uh, and like I said, too, there's uh, much happening. So, so much. Uh, I can't cover it all. I cannot cover it all. Uh, which kind of reminds me of... Uh, this kind of reminds me of the feeling I get when, uh, for birthdays and Christmas, uh, I get some mad money to spend. And you know, folks ask me what I want. And it's like, get me iTunes money. Big music connoisseur, certain types of music. And um, so, you know, I get about $200 from everybody, all told. And, um, you know, but, you know, so spending it on music, it's like, you know, you eventually you run out, you know, $100, $200 runs out and it's like, oh man, what, you know, I didn't get this. I wanted, wanted to get that too. And, and um, kind of, this is kind of the way it is for me, you know, putting together these lessons and especially with areas, regions like this. And like, um, you know, I just, I wanted to, I really want to cover China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, it encompasses so much in regard to the nervousness of the U.S., China's neighbors, and maybe increasingly other areas of, you know, uh, what's China, you know, China seems to be uh, getting their nose into a lot of areas around the globe via infrastructure. And I don't have time to develop that right now. It's in your textbook, and I'm not going to cover it uh, with the lecture, but um uh, I didn't know what to cut, you know. Um, and as I say that, I may, by you know, I'm taping this during the uh, summer months. By the time we get to this, there may be a uh, announcement for you guys that we are. I'm going to have you read this section, and there will be quiz questions on it. But as of, as I sit here at this juncture, um, I'm not doing that. If you have your textbooks, um, you should by now, your visuals, uh, you can turn to page 275. And um, as you're doing that, I'll do what I like to do and get the um, screen share up. I just do not want that. Okay. Hit the wrong button there. I apologize for that. Let's try that again. This is what I want. Okay. Yes. East Asia. Um, some of the... Got that backwards again and should get the objectives up there first. I like to talk about that. I guess it doesn't matter. I just like my routines. Uh, objectives. We want to become aware of East Asian cultural foundations. Uh, understand the region's transformation into the global economy and uh, differentiate the effects of uh, capitalism and uh, communism, All right? Major heads up terms here, the Asian way, the Asian way uh, throughout the region, there's a way that um, you're expected to relate to order, uh, relational um, aspects of order, father, son, and you know, so forth. A little more detail on that in a few moments. Uh, Confucius and Taoism. Uh, Confucius, 
was a uh, you know, philosopher, uh, believed in uh, uh, order, um, and uh, Taoism was uh, about balance, right? About balance. Taoism and Confucianism were kind of at odds with uh, one another. Uh, uh, Confucianism, order, uh, and you uh, maintain that order by your authority structures like the government. Taoism is more or less uh, looking at uh, uni the universal uh, goal. But, yeah, the goal was balance uh, between uh, humans and the uh, principles of the universe, right? Shinto, Shinto, the national religion of Japan. The national religion of Japan. We have uh, we're, the Gaijin complex. The Gaijin complex, um, arguably, you know, we use the word racism, arguably, um, maybe irresponsibly. Uh, we use it to, you know, get what we want politically out of things. And um, if you could, if you really wanted to take a look at maybe the, the um, according to the uh, correct vocabulary of racism of feeling superior to another race um, might be a, a, a culture we're going to take a talk about today. And it's called the Gaijin complex. Uh, the open door policy, this is China opening, uh, opening up trade with the, uh, the rest of the globe. The Great Leap Forward, uh, Great Leap Forward, uh, just an atrocity on humanity, right? Mismanagement uh, in China in the late 1950s, early 1960s, 25, 30 million people die. Uh, the Cultural Revolution, uh, as bad as the Great Leap Forward was, uh, I don't know if many people died, but many did under the Cultural Revolution. Uh, maybe it was probably worse. Uh, Great Leap Forward, just stupidity of the system. The Cultural Revolution was um, a calculated attempt to, by the Chinese government to eliminate opposition to the tune of millions. Uh, that was under the uh, leadership of Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong led the Communist Revolution in the late 40s. And the household responsibility system, household responsibility system. This was early on after Mao died and the powers that be could see that they're going to have to make some types of um, economic adjustments to get into um, the wider world and not have the problems that they had with um, part and parcel with the Great Leap Forward and and uh, the bad economies that the Chinese would have. And that was basically where the, the uh, household responsibility system, where when it came to agriculture, the government would let folks keep portions of what they grew and use it for, you know, evil profits, right? Evil profits that the, the uh, communists um, so decried and, and hated right uh in china but they had you know in order to get the economy in a, a direction where it could be um self-sustaining so let's get into this got some notes right off the bat um chinese empire right chinese empires the asian way a hierarchy of relationships on how folks work and live uh, ruler, subject, uh, boss, employer, uh, father, son, uh, older and the younger. And this was a shared, this is, it still is shared common culture uh, among the region. Then you have your foundations of Chinese cultures. You got Confucius, right? Confucius called for professional administrators to focus on conducting orderly conduct and proper behavior uh, throughout society and uh, in all social contexts. Uh, his principles led to uh, government appointments through multi-based uh, written exams. 
Taoism, Taoism, uh, disdained Confucianism. Uh, it advocated local control uh, based off the yin and the yang, right? Yin and the yang, opposites. The opposites uh, seen as two breaths, the chi, spelled G-I. So everyone's uh, purpose is to expand the chi, obtain balance. And you can see it even in the architecture uh, in China, right? Um, you have uh, what they call male architecture, right? I, I, is, um, you know, the part of the yin and the yang, the two genders, uh, the male architecture and the female architecture. I'm trying to find that balance. The male architecture may be more pointed and uh, the female architecture uh, more rounded, soft colors and Shinto, Japanese isolationism. Now I'm going to be saying some things in here that are gonna make me sound uh, anti-Japanese. It's not that, I'm just telling you the facts about culture, right? Culture and history. And uh, you can do what you want with that. But um, Shinto is the, nat the national religion and it's based on animism. Based on animism, uh, all things in nature have souls and ancient myths and customs. It's a pantheistic religion, uh, which involves emperor worship and Japanese uh, superiority. Uh, you can see figure 719, I believe it is. It's on page 293. I'm having a hard time reading my writing between nine and the nine and the eight. But if you um, turn to page 293, uh, you'll see if it's figure 718, that's, that's what I meant. 719, that's what I meant, okay? So, yeah, uh, it, it involves emperor worship and Japanese superiority. Now, I'll just say something real quickly about that, too. Um, kind of interesting. So, emperor worship and Japanese superiority. So, God is looked at in Japan as Japanese. And the Japanese superiority bit. Um, the Japanese went through a little um, nervous breakdown after World War II because, you know, they didn't win, right? They lost. And they lost to what I'm coming up here to, uh, uh, onto is a white foreigner, okay? So um, I was like, hey, what happened? How could, how could we have lost? We're superior, you know, and uh, to this white guy, Jean. So um, enter uh, that concept here. Um, yeah, God and creation are the same in nature and uh, revering what exists is akin to worshiping God. So Japanese superiority, Japanese superiority can be seen in the Daijin complex. And that's one of your um, heads up terms. It's um, xenophobia, right? An arrogance of Japanese culture over all other cultures. Uh, foreigners, especially um, white foreigners, are not respected. However, because of the Japanese mindset of superiority, um, they have invaded and roughed over neighbors uh, for quite a while, right? The Japanese are... Uh, hated by the Chinese and the Koreans and, you know, others in that region and in the next region that we're going to um, see as well. Let's take a look at um, Japanese isolationism a little more deeply here. Japanese, um, Japan's population is um, about 98.5% Japanese, and it's probably the most homogenous uh, society in the world. And it's widely believed that this has led the country to kind of a sense of purpose. And there's so many other cool things about that I'd like to talk to you about, but um, I'm just not going to have the time to do it. 
let's take a look at Korea. Right? Korea was um, annexed by the uh, the Japanese in uh, 1910. And you could see figure 774 on page 346. Page 346 and kind of curious about what I was looking at there, what I want you to see. And yeah, just a, a map, right? An overall uh, map of the region. So yeah, you want to keep a keep a mark, a bookmark in there and uh, turn to that as uh, we need to. But uh, yeah, right, this is geography. We need the maps. So throughout history, uh, Korea was, uh, as I say, um, collected up, right? Collected up in the rivalry between Japan and China. Thus, it come, becomes a vassal state um, of one or the other. Uh, Japan's annexation came as a result of China's decline uh, in the 19th century. And the past has cast a shadow between the two countries. Uh, issues occasionally emerge um, as such as fighting rights and island control. World War II, as I said, though, World War II marks the end of Japan's control of Korea. Um, Korea split. Let's take a look at Korea split uh, 1950, uh, the Korean War, right? Korean War. Uh, they assisted the United States in the uh, Pacific Theater during the end of World War II. Uh, both allies accepted uh, Japan's surrender on the Korean Peninsula, drawing up an arbitrary in the line at the 38th parallel. Again, on page 346, it would probably behoove you to take a look at, uh, find out where the Koreas are, North and South Korea and uh, look at the uh, divide, the division there between North and South Korea. Just above Seoul, uh, you see uh, the shaded color of North Korea, and that would be the um, 38th parallel. So the Soviets, and this is during the Cold War, the Soviets accepted the territory north of that line and the United States, the area south of that line. So the line was just to be temporary, but it has become permanent, right? Uh, each country set up governments that would be friendly to them, right? So in North Korea, you have a communist government. June 25th, 1950, the war began. Uh, North Korean troops invaded, taking, uh, taking Seoul. Uh, Truman sent in troops to defend the territory uh, under the UN flag with 16 other nations. And just kind of going back uh, at World War II, right, um, the Soviets were allies of ours. And um, so there was an agreement made uh, when once the shooting stopped that, you know, Soviets were, you know, very interested in that territory too, that peninsula, and we divided it up, right, along the 38th parallel. So yeah, Truman sent in troops to um, defend the territory under the UN flag with 16 other nations. By September of 1950, uh, General Douglas MacArthur, right? He jammed uh, the advance all the way back to the Chinese border at the uh, Yalu River. And you could see um, just north of, northwest of North Korea, the border of China. And you can see the Yalu River there. And lost, kind of lost my place there. Oh, yeah. Um, apologize for that. Um, yeah, so we're all the way up to the Yalu River. And uh, MacArthur, at that time, he stresses using nukes, right? He stresses nuking, every, nuking the area. Uh, Truman resists, right? Truman's the commander of the chief, uh, commander in chief. So MacArthur's got a little problem here because MacArthur doesn't agree with him. And MacArthur went ahead uh, with bombs and uh, Truman sacked him, right? A lot of Americans at the, to at the time uh, were disappointed in MacArthur, but I think over time, um, 
recollection has been kinder to uh, MacArthur and his position. The Chinese responded, right? The Chinese responded when seeing enemies at the doorstep by sending in troops in, uh, in human waves, to be quite um, graphic about it. Um, so they shoved the UN troops south of the 38th parallel, taking Seoul on January 4th, 1951. The UN forces recaptured Seoul two months later as the battlefront stabilized along the 38th parallel. So this proxy war ends in a ceasefire where it remains to this day, right? The war is ongoing, right? We, we need to finish it. So the two Koreas are separated by a 150 mile long, two and one half mile zone called the DMZ. So again, you look at the boundary, the DMZ, and picture this, you know, a 150 mile uh, wide, uh, long barrier, two and a half mile wide zone called a DMZ. So it's called a demilitarized zone. South Korea was uh, once a military dictatorship until 1987. And it is um, now now a democratic republic. Now a democratic republic uh, with, uh, I might add, an advanced uh, capitalist system. So, but it's dependent on its relationship with Japan and the United States. North Korea, as we know, is a police state uh, promoting what it calls a juche, right? Juche. So what's up with the uh, Juche? Well, basically, um, North Korea wants um, to be self-reliant, right? They want to be self-reliant and, um, you know, not reliant on uh, certainly any of the um, you know, neighboring um, neighboring areas. So, you know, Juche um, you know, independence, right? They want independence, um, be self-sustaining, um, have a national self-defense. And yeah, again, complete limitation from the outside world. It's in fact, North Korea is, is called uh, the world's hermit, right? So responses from this area, responses uh, to the um, outside uh, outside world, and um, beginning in um, the 1500s, the uh, Portuguese led European expeditions to the region. China resists any kind of colonization. Uh, demand for Chinese tea uh, comes through the British East India Company, uh, the Brits traded opium at the southern port of Gangzhou, and you could see a poster on page 297, a poster uh, that was um, published in 1900, figure 723, and uh, in this political cartoon, Colonial powers are seen dividing up China under the enraged but helpless Qin Dynasty. From left to right, you got Queen Victoria of Great Britain, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, the Tsar Nicholas in Russia, uh, Marianne as the emblem of France, and a samurai soldier representing Japan. Qin government forbade the opium trade. And it starts the Opium War of 1841-1842. Um, what happened there was confiscated uh, British opium uh, ends up in a murder of a, um, a Chinese port authority by British and American soldiers. Um, the war was confined to a particular area, uh, to Canton and east, some of the east uh, cities. Uh, as far north as Tangine, 
uh, British, the Britain, uh, the, the Brits do threaten Nanjing and uh, the Qin dynasty eventually sues for peace. And this is at the, the juncture where um, shortly thereafter that the British uh, gain Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong about, I guess, about 40, 50 years later. Japanese aggression, right? Again, I don't want to sound harsh. I don't want to sound anti-Japanese. Uh, during the 1800s, uh, the Japanese build uh, military to counter this uh, newfound Western aggression. Uh, they begin to modernize. They begin to modernize for economic stability, which leads to trade, uh, mediocre goods, right? Um, they democratized in the uh, 1900s, and they set up an internal pact uh, between the Japanese military and the Japanese elite, who at the time were the Zabutsu family. And uh, that family owned all of the uh, Japanese uh, big industry, right? So uh, it, is, it is, this combats against Japanese goods. And this leads to uh, World War II because the Japanese invade China and uh, they invade the Manchuria area, to be specific, a lot of copper and uh, other resources in that region. And, uh, you know, it gets the West nervous. And, um, you know, and they do this because they see themselves as the superior race. World War II changes a lot here, changes a lot of um, Japanese confidence, I guess you could say. Turn to page 277. I want to just look at the physical environment here uh, momentarily. And um, 277, you have uh, East Asia's physical environment. And it's very, uh, very uh, diverse. You have humid climate, ra climates ranging from cool mid-latitude in the north to subtropical and tropical in the south. And you got Mongolia. And uh, Western China are dominated by arid and semi-arid climates. Uh, the region has a substantial and diverse natural resource base uh, as well. Um, much of the region is mountainous with much of the larger lowlands concentrated in Eastern China. You got high mountains and plateaus that dominate Western China and serve as a headwaters for uh, many, uh, many, many of the um, many of the rivers. Okay, active plate boundaries in the region. So it's fairly seismic activity. Some of the world's worst earthquakes have uh, located, been located in that uh, particular, particular area. I want to take a look now at China's entry into the global economy. globalization in East Asia. China has a, a system of controlled capitalism. And a lot of times you'll hear the word, we throw these words around irresponsibly. You'll hear the word fascism, right? Fa he's a fascist. Fascism is basically um, Hitler and the Nazis did it. It was uh, controlled capitalism controlled capitalism uh and i i would strongly argue that's what china is today right they're communists but they have a a controlled free market system so china has a system of this and between 1990 and 2010 the economy grew at the astounding rate of uh, 10 percent um it gradually slowed as its growth now is around 7%. But let me just say something about that. 7% growth, most people around the globe would die for that, right? That's that's good growth. Um, further economic constant contractions were due to COVID-19, um, like other Asian countries who uh, endured these uh, vi viral outbreaks. Uh, China was um, better prepared to deal with it compared to other regions, quite frankly. And so therefore, China was able to um, return to economic normalcy. 
earlier than uh, other countries. And it's pre-pandemic 7% uh, annual growth. China's uh, economic trajectory. Uh, up through the 1980s, China was known for making cheap toys. Uh, wealthier nations did not have much interest in these types of purchases. So in the 1980s, the Chinese were known to make just about anything. Um, consumer electronics, um, they became the leading, leading manufacturer of that. Uh, probably since the 90s. Uh, page 301 in your uh, textbook. I have uh, you guys turning to that. And yes, there is figure 726. Uh, Apple products. Apple product factory there, right? And a young lady there. Um, I don't know, it's supposed to say she's smiling for the camera, but she's not. But anyway, you can look at that. Um, check that out. So... Once the dot-com bubble burst um, in the United States around the turn of the century, um, that is where the origins of China's high-tech boom really begins. China's interest in the World Trade Organization 2001, uh, foreign investment, right, because of what I'm talking about, begins pouring in, uh, coupled with tax incentives, by the Chinese subsidized loans and cheap land. Uh, China had a growing pool of also of university trained engineers and you know, less expensive labor. China's economic area. Well, during the 90s, China, the China was buying up um, manufacturing manufacturers and exports of medium from the uh, Asian tigers of Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. We'll get to them next. And they really boomed uh, during this time. So those types of goods begin to shift toward China once the Chinese join the um, WTO. So the United States, the Japanese, and South, South Korea and Europe began moving their production to China to, to cut costs, um, you know, i.e. labor and environmental regulations. Cheap labor and its relation to permanent foreign investment. Um, cheap labor doesn't seem to have, have made foreign investment last. Uh, factory workers, their wages doubled in the 2010s. So, you know, labor wasn't cheap anymore. Uh, chi uh, China's one-child policy, uh, it will probably soon take effect with the less indus industrial workers, right? They're forced abortions of, uh, um, you know, just having one child. Uh, China in general is uh, becoming pricier, okay? Uh, the population is aging part and parcel because of the one-child policy. Thus, the workforce is shrinking. Uh, inflation and uh, unemployment are uh, therefore uh, growing as well. The U.S.-Chinese trade relationship. The trade relationship has favored China. Uh, exports from China dwarfs the number of imports from the U.S. Uh, China's e economic rise is incrementally catching up to the U.S. dominance in the region. Uh, in 2020, the Chinese signed a free trade agreement, well, several free trade agreements with over a dozen uh, oceanic nations. Then you got the uh, Trump factor. You had the Trump factor. Uh, Trump argued that tariffs on Chinese imports would cut into the trade deficit and lure U.S. companies to stay in the United States. His 2018-19 
uh, tariffs were ex expectantly, I knew this was going to happen, met with Chinese retaliation on our imports. So what were the realities of these? It becomes a trade war. And the realities was that the trade deficit between the U.S. and China did decrease. And China uh, and uh, Mr. Trump did have that right about the, you know, we were kind of taking to the cleaners on certain things. But globally, it doesn't it doesn't really do anything. Right. The reality of the trade wars, it doesn't doesn't help anything globally. And maybe that and I don't think that was. Um, you know, President Trump's um, goal uh, in the first place. Japan's economic geography, right? Japanese development compared to the uh, U.S., the um, Japanese GNI gross uh, national income in uh, 1980 or 1960 was just one eighth of that of the United States. By 1990, it was. Uh, by 1990, it was 53% uh, percent of the U.S., and it has since slowed with uh, increased government regulation. Economic de uh, development, the primary sector where you're just, you know, you know, fishing and mining and farming was, uh, was at 1%. It was actually 33% after World War II. Uh, the manufacturing sector is also a drop to 21%. Um, the service sector is at about 70% of the uh, Japanese economy. Uh, agriculture still uh, depends on uh, a lot of large uh, government subsidies. Migration from farm to city has also made for uh, better jobs. Uh, education has given the Japanese farmer um, new challenges. Uh, manufacturing reconstruction, the um, Japanese recovery in the uh, 1950s was due to um, three areas. Uh, American aid, right? Contracts during the Korean War, buses and or bases and, and, and airports. Uh, and a lack of need, right, for the Japanese to have to invest in the military. They were being protected by the U.S. So this is, you know, these are the three areas that really make, allow the, uh, the Japanese economy to boom. And, of course, the Gaijin, right, we are remaking Japan in our own image, the mock free market democracy, right? Um, the military of international trade and industry, the MITI uh, in Japan, that encouraged export sales by advising and its assisting industry through a worldwide network of market intelligence uh, gathering offices. So with that, you had these timely innovations such as building large oil tankers uh, for a cheap way of transporting oil through global choke points like you know, the Panama Canal. Uh, the Strait of Hormuz, the Suez Canal, manufacturers, global investments. Um, Japan made major changes to industry uh, in the 1980s, uh, more investment overseas, establishing Japanese firms overseas, and major booms in uh, domestic retailing uh, during the same uh, time period. Take a look at your textbook again, your map there, page 346, figure 774. And I want you to zero in on that island called Japan. Because I want to say something about the population and the um, some of the advantages and disadvantages of that island, the size of it. Um, the nation's dramatic economic growth after World War II uh, their defeat was one of the 20th century's more incredible feats, otherwise known as the 
Japanese miracle. So you had wise investing in industry and industrial plants. The political culture, the LDP, the Liberal Democrat Democratic Party, has been the sole ruling party since 1955. Um, conservative, it's very conservative and it's uh, business friendly. Uh, it cooperates with the business community in new products and new industries. The relationship between politicians and business, uh, what we would call crony capitalism, seen elsewhere in Southeast Asia, which we'll look at next, has been to blame for the erosion of uh, Japanese growth. So there's anything I want to say on that, the rise and fall of the um, Japanese economy. Again, a lot of good stuff there. Just don't have time to do it. I would say this, um, despite the problems, Japan's economy is the fourth largest um, in the world. It's uh, trade surplus and low rates of inflation uh, and unemployment as a result. you got major companies there such as Toyota, Honda, Nissan, and they have global business, right? you got Sony, Panasonic, Nintendo that make uh, Jap you know, Japan the world's preeminent uh, electronics industry okay so oops. got that uh, with uh, with Japan so I want to go to next here let's um take a look at um, go back to China right, go back to China oh um Korea I want you to, um, this is in your readings, a fork in the road, the Koreas. Uh, we looked at, you know, what happened. We looked at the Korea War, Korean War and the split between the North and the South. Because of time, I want you to read pages 350 to the next to last paragraph to the end of the chapter on page 352 on that. Because that stuff's going to, information will show up on the quiz and, and so forth. So you're going to need to read that. China collectivization and uh, the communes in 1949, China began to model its changes uh, on the uh, Soviet model after the Chinese took, the communists took over. A large social investment uh, in the industry, not too much in agriculture, right? They're copying those five year plans of Joseph Stalin looking to industrialize. Uh, most of the investment went into manufacturing, obviously. Uh, government added communes, right? Combined agriculture, industry, trade, and education, local militia. Uh, general needs were guaranteed, right? The communist system was underway under these communes. The Great Leap Forward. And here's some of the results of uh, just the mismanagement of the communist system. The Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. You had an emphasis on industry that brought a neglect to farming uh, coupled with droughts brings about a death total of 30 million people i mean how sad does it get right cultural revolution saw the purges of the educated classes of uh, great leap forward was 1959 to 1961 you know 10 years after the communists took control uh cultural revolution 1966 to 76 uh, right up on the eve of Mao Zedong's death in 1976, the Cultural Revolution saw the purges of the educated classes, uh, potential capitalists, and former political leaders to the tune of just millions of people, right, uh, dying. So the question, where does China go, right? Where to now, uh, China, a lot of people wonder because of the, um, you know, some of these heavy handed uh, abuses and, uh, you know, how is that going to, um, how's that going to work, right? 
Well, where to China, I've dubbed this here. Concerns regarding liberty, right? Concerns regarding liberty. Freedom of expression, right? Freedom of express expression. Um, the Chinese government censors the internet, right? Otherwise known as the uh, great, uh, the great firewall of um, of uh, China. So, in order to gain access to China's markets, uh, American tech companies may be giving the uh, all this tomfoolery and these shenanigans. Um, they might be ignoring it, right? I think they might be ignoring it. Uh, the N the NBA. Um, they are making uh, a lot of money in uh, China. Uh, they have uh, uh, people like LeBron James has um, failed to use his social platform, as far as I know, to talk about uh, the, some of the clampdowns on Hong Kong, you know, and so forth. So feeding a socialist economy, you got these gigantic projects uh, to prop up a socialist market. And these process, these projects are kind of soaking up the national treasury. So you have this potential economic bubble. And, and historically, uh, the law of averages are not on China's side in keeping up with all that growth I talked about. Not for too long. Because here's the thing, some of the cancers, I guess, underneath, um, the growth is ignited by speculative cash flows and questionable bank loans. Pardon me, let me turn this off. Speculative cash flows and questionable bank loans. Real estate accounts for 20% of the China, China's economy, a much higher proportion than that of the United States and Spain when their economies burst. The funding for the property boom is fueled by overvalued government-owned property, primarily consisting of land. So the solution, the way I see it, is uh, an economy based on maybe um, household consumption uh, rather than on exports. So you'll want to curb domestic spending and authoritarian tactics uh, rather than, um, you know, from government, because many are leaving China as a result uh, of the latter. Then you got the problem of Hong Kong, right? You got the problem of Hong Kong. Uh, China has uh, dismissed it's a uh, rhetoric of one country and two systems as it has enacted restrictions on freedom in Hong Kong. Uh, the restrictions have um, been met by enormous uh, anti-China demonstrations. Uh, unfortunately, um, we, you know, the current administration has been uh, really silent about this. Uh, the, um, Again, uh, people in high places in the athletic world have been uh, silent about it as well. So Hong Kong was a British colony, right, for 100 years, and the Brits gave that back um, in uh, 1997. So lastly, um, China's two problem, China or China's problem in Taiwan, I want you to read uh, pages 345 to 347, and uh, you will be responsible for knowing that because that information will show up on uh, the quiz as uh, as well. Okay, so let's um, take a look at uh, what's up ahead. Uh, because of time, you can check out your uh, graphic organizer. Reading, again, page 345, 347, and 350, 352. Thursday night, we have an in the news that's uh, that's due. All right, you guys know the drill now. We're down the highway. Friday, the initial discussion post. Sunday, Saturday, two response posts. Uh, Monday, we'll quiz, and then uh, we'll begin 
dropping south a little bit, Southeast Asia. So if any questions, comments, you guys know how to get a hold of me. Got the phones ringing all over the place. Someone wants to get a hold of me badly. And uh, so I'm going to have to get going here. So I will see you guys later. Have a great one.